Well, I'm going to do some more on my motorcycle coveralls. Provided the internet cooperates, it may not. Actually, in contact, he's a very charming, sympathetic, friendly, rather reliable man. So that one's own definition of oneself does not necessarily think anything more than a poetic one. He would claim that he had been, that his fate had been determined by somebody else's game. And that is what makes him an outlaw. But then he remade the game for himself by accepting the situation. Oh, shit. Redefining the rules and acting according to them. That is, he, in that, he is the most oh, law-abiding of men. Markers. I cannot imagine him ever infringing on one of his self-inflicted rules. Bitch. His oh, rules may be about one. pederastic love, treason in the realm of military dominance, or the administration of property rights. But he's made that all very definite. He's a very legalistic man. So laughing with him one day long ago about the fact that in London a heavy paper called International Times, I think, had been seized by the police because of some advertisements uh, suggesting sexual encounters between males or something or another had caused the, the issue or even the whole paper to be seized. I didn't. This happened in Tangier when I was telling him this. And he said he'd like to send in an ad. So he sat down and wrote out this advertisement for me, which has been rather indifferently translated in this very handsome book. But uh, whoever did this didn't really speak French very well. Nevertheless, the text runs more or less like this in English. Jean Genet seeks or searches for or would like to discover or never discover. The delicious enemy, quite disarmed, whose balance is unsteady, profile dubious, face inadmissible. The enemy, whom one breath breaks. The slave, already abased, hurling himself from a window at a signal. The enemy vanquished, blind, deaf, and dumb. Without arms, without legs, without bowels, without heart, sex, head. And such a complete enemy, already bearing upon himself all the marks of my bestiality, which you would no longer, <laughs> I wonder what he meant, um, which you would no longer have to, or, uh, ex or too lazy, which would no longer have to exert itself, too lazy. I think that's the correct translation. Anyhow, I would like the total enemy who would have me spontaneously and without limits, but the enemy subdued, vanquished by me before knowing me, and in any case, irreconcilable with me. No friends. Above all, no friends. A sworn enemy. But one, I'm torn. I don't think she was right about this. While, without fault, but in what colors? From green, tender, like an unripe cherry, to effervescent purple. His stature, between the two of us, let him come to me man to man. No friends. I seek an enemy growing weak, coming in for surrender. I will give him slaps, blows, kicks. I'll have him ripped by hungered foxes. Make him eat English food. Attend the House of Lords, be received at Buckingham Palace, make him fuck Prince Philip and be fucked by him, make him live in a month in London, dress like me, sleep in my bed, I seek the sworn enemy, and perhaps tonight dear Jean is out looking still for the sworn enemy or having already found him. Then, after this, I thought that I would read something more uh, pertinent to the moment, at least pertinent to my work, because I've been some mm, 14 years trying to write a book that sort of got the whole story of all of us in the Paris days at the Beat Hotel. And I invented somebody who's rather like a couple of young friends of ours, 
one not so young, but one quite young, who have an enormous amount of money, but I imagine that this boy's grandson, for example, would really have all the money in the world and have decided that he was going to buy it all and take it all to Southern California, where naturally things should go. And as he has an accident in front of his museum in Malibu, he suddenly finds himself on a bridge over a river, which is apparently the Seine, and there he meets Camus, uh, who he doesn't like or understand. And he says something very insulting to Camus, who then becomes purple-black with rage, like a Sienese quattrocento devil. His mouth writhes around a word he cannot speak. He's stomping his feet and clawing at the air and moving his arms around, as are a lot of his French literary buddies, who suddenly materialized in a goodly crowd around him here on this bridge, which is swarming with traffic all of a sudden. It would be a real mob scene, only the soundtrack has been turned off apparently, except for this ringing in my ears, there's no sound at all, and nobody here in the shades can talk except me. And me, I go on, but a lot less belligerently, because I suddenly remember what my guru used to tell me about communicating with evil entities, how you gotta be careful. And any way you look at it, it is a privilege to meet him, or so I like to tell myself in the circumstances, but just to rile him, I begin to tell Camus a little bit about my museum. You see, French intellectuals love culture, don't they? Right. But by culture, they mean French culture, and that's the end of that. It's also old hat and out of date, but I can't really blame them for their attitude about me and my very American venture. They hate and fear the very size of it. Our American size frightens them. Their hate and fear is the same size as this. It's all very human, but my museum of museums has a real sweep to it. I tell him that my museum of museums sweeps all the way across Southern California from the Pacific Palisades at Malibu, across the Mojave Desert, back and up into the depths of Death Valley. I've cut the state of California in two with the Great Wall of China, which I had them bring over and string out along the line of the Los Angeles Viaduct to protect us all from all that San Simeon nonsense up there in Northern California. My God, Hearst, phew! One of the most embarrassing things about my revered ancestor, the museum founder, the worst thing that he almost ever let drop to the press, was that he identified himself with old Randy Hearst to such an extent that if their lives had not overlapped, he would have thought that he was a reincarnation of that old bastard. Like him and none but that one respect, I found one day that I had of a hell of a lot too much Italian Renaissance stuff on my hands and nowhere to put it. Now, out beyond San Fernando, there's a nifty little spot on the map called Ravenna, and that gave me an idea. Why not ship over and re-erect the entire Italian Renaissance right there? I did this. That's how I first got in contact with my great Swiss firm of movers, Interdean International Movers. They ran a real crazy ad in the Herald Tribune reading, Call us. We can move Heidelberg Castle to Hoboken for you. So I called them, collect, in Munich at 14150136, and asked if they could move the Renaissance to Ravenna. Some idiotic German woman tittered over the phone and told me that the Italian Renaissance is already in Ravenna. I said, Ravenna, California, care of me. You all know who I am. I'm little PG6. I'll take it on credit. She turned me over to someone else who got it moving overnight. Long before I had our little California Ravenna ready for it, there was the whole Italian Renaissance in crates sitting out in Southern California sunshine. It was good to see it in this light. Thereafter, I was entirely sold on interdev international movers forever and a day. The next thing they came up with was the Parthenon. Lambros Carnavalos, their man in Athens, ran an ad with a drawing of himself in gym clothes, carrying the Parthenon on his back, and the ad said, and for my next amazing feat, so I took him up on it. But since he had the Turks hot on his back at that moment, he offered me the Agora of ancient Athens as restored by the Americans. I didn't much go for that until he called it a shopping mall, and that gave me the idea of setting it down in Palmdale, California. For the same price, 
Lambros threw in what little remains of the Temple of Jupiter Thunderer, which was rebuilt by the Roman Emperor Hadrian. Now I wanted that because my revered ancestor, the founder, felt that he had a great deal in common with Hadrian. He once told the press, quote unquote, I would very much like to think I was a reincarnation of Hadrian's spirit, and I would like to emulate him as much as possible. You must never have heard about Hadrian's sex life. Because when his beautiful Lydian bum boy Antinous was eaten by crocodiles in the Nile, he had him declared a god. Now, in California, in Hollywood, about the nearest thing that we have to that is our unfortunate neighbor, the apparently immortal love goddess. I wish some of our cultured crocodiles had eaten her long ago. The house her prince built for her hangs right over the edge of our ravine in Malibu and overlooks the original museum building, the sham Pompeian villa built for my revered ancestor, the founder, old P.G. the first. So, I believe that he would have been horrified if he saw it, but he never got to see it at all because he was a tax exile in Europe, in England. And he couldn't come over to see it himself or find out what they had wrought with his millions. It was supposed to be a real time trip, but to be overlooked by the neighbors like that makes the whole thing look as phony as it is, just so much California real estate. I hate the place, but I kept it on as my main office and that's where I had my accident. But I digress. It's not at all true what you hear about me, that uh, I've decided to take Notre Dame Cathedral to California. I already have the Louvre and a few other things, but I don't want the cathedrals. I decided no cathedrals in California for me. I hate them. What I've come to Paris for is the shabby old beat hotel in that narrow little street over there. La Rue de la Chienly, is that the right way to pronounce it? Chienly Street, or Shit in the Bed Street in English. I'm going to put that little old hotel down in California in an oasis I own at Palmdale. Palmdale on the Bulge, they call it. Because Palmdale is bang on, bang on the San Andreas fault line. You've all heard about that, of course. Of course you have. Everyone's heard about all that old talk about a an almighty earthquake that's going to happen along there one day. They've been predicting it forever, and I am counting on it. Matter of fact, the Parthenon was broken when I got it. So I refused to pay for it. Until Lambros came up with some of the missing pieces from the British Museum, the Ashmolean, and some English Duke's country place where they were using it as garden furniture. Then I had the Zappian Gardens from Athens laid out on the outskirts of Palmdale, running right down to the re-erected temple of Jupiter in a jumpsuit, as I called him. It became a real hangout for the angels and the dykes on bikes crowd, partly because of the uh, nearby turnpike N4. Actually, the Parthenon looks better there than it ever did in Athens. Everything looks better in California. It's the lights. Light here in Paris is like, like lead, isn't it? I look down into the river below and I see it's a great whirlpool of sewage, of sand. I know I, exactly what's happening, of course, because I took a course in it. Um, uh, the map of underground Paris shows a sewage stream called La Chi, which runs right under Shenley Street to come gushing up into the mainstream of the river Seine in a maelstrom of turds and used condoms. This poor polluted rivulet rises in Montparnasse, the Mount of the Muses where the artists used to hang out. Everybody knows their filthy habits. From there it runs underground beneath the French Parthenon and their Sorbonne, picking up who knows what vile pieces of human detritus from the dissection table to the medical school before it plunges under the Latin Quarter for its last swift race beneath the Chenley Street and the old beat hotel to gush up into the Seine at the end of the street. Now, I have read in my archives that William S. Burroughs used to stroll across from the beat hotel to lean over the bridge at this spot, staring into this vortex for hours, picking up on his inspiration. It's all, folks.
continue tomorrow night. All three books will be continued for the next three nights. It's right there. So what, what, what number is it? It's 1,673. Wow. If I take Metropolitan Avenue, it's going to be a whole wood.